to municipality site, um, enabling better places, a user's guide to Wisconsin neighborhood affordability. So uh, this study came out with seven recommendations and I'm just gonna read through these briefly and then I'll get into more detail as we go through the PowerPoint. But the first recommendation was to allow, the, allow multi-unit housing as a permitted use in single family zoning districts, which have historically included two family and multi-family. The second one is to realign lot widths and areas to match historic patterns favoring narrower lots. The third one is to reduce setbacks to historic distances to allow greater use of existing lots. The fourth is to allow accessory dwelling units by right in, for all single family zoning districts. Number five is to permit residential uses, including multifamily in commercial districts. Number six is to reduce or eliminate parking minimums. And number seven is to assess and streamline the subdivision and workforce housing application process, including standards that direct development outcomes and a time limit on municipal response. So starting out with the first uh, recommendation, allow multi-unit housing as a permitted use in single family zoning districts, which have historically included two family and multi-family. So under the current city of Sheboygan zoning ordinance, uh, we do not allow multi-unit housing by right in single family zones. So to give you a feel, the map on the right of this screen are the single family zones uh, within the city. So the darker is suburban residential three. Um, you can see those as primarily in the far north and the northeast side. Under a single residential three um, zoning district, it is three dwelling units per gross acre and the typical lot size is about 10,000 square feet. Um, suburban residential five or SR5 is um, five dwelling units per acre with a typical size of about 6,000 square feet. So the picture there shows you a typical Northeast uh, Sheboygan neighborhood. Um, that neighborhood at Fifth and Euclid is zoned suburban residential five. So you can kind of see the density of those um, neighborhoods and this designation preserves and protects uh, the suburban residential community character for those who want to live in this environment. So if we were to adopt this recommendation, this is what you would get. This apartment building could be built, sorry Roberta Flicky Pineski, this is over the top of your house, but this, um, but, <laughs> But, but if somebody wanted some great lake views, they could build a multifamily housing development of this sort in um, this zoning district by right and wouldn't have to go through any type of approval process. So what we have today, the way it currently stands is in order to do that, you would have to go through a rezone process which triggers a um, rezoning hearing of the Common Council and the neighbors have an option to come in and talk about it and you have a more public engaged process than just allowing these types of units to pop up wherever you want in these single family districts. So that's just a representation of what would happen if we would adopt that recommendation. The next recommendation is realign lot widths and areas to match historic patterns favoring narrow lots. The city of Sheboygan currently has very narrow lots. Our uh, standard lot size, our minimum lot size is 6,000 square feet, which is 60, by 100, 60 feet wide by 100 feet deep. And this uh, lot size allows for a little bit of side yard, not a ton, but some side yard on both sides of the house. The, the pictures on here shows um, what a 60.4 uh, lot size looks like and what that is from the street. And you can see that there is some green between the garages and the house on the uh, side yards and it's not you know, typically densely packed. It gives you some opportunity around the property. If we were to go to a 40 foot wide, and take this recommendation, which we have some of these lots in the older parts of the neighborhood uh, of the city, you can see that the uh, narrower lots tend to cause more issues with 
where do you discharge your sump pump? I, I live on a 40 by 100 lot and I struggle every day with the neighbor's sump pump flooding my basement when it rains and where do I put my sump pump water? So that's a challenge. Um, and it also tends to lead to more neighborhood disputes and then higher police concerns. So you can see in the image, um, the, the house is right on the property line. There's very little setback in side yards. So the, the recommendation now of keeping our six, you know, of keeping what we have is where we're at uh, from a standpoint of uh, denser isn't always better. Um, it creates additional issues for us. So, um, you know, I think this recommendation might be more geared towards uh, suburban areas that have lot larger, lot a lot larger lot sizes than we do, um, <clears throat> but we're already pretty densely packed with what we have. The next recommendation is reduce setbacks to historic distances to allow greater use of existing lots. Um, <clears throat> we right now in our zoning ordinance, there is language in there that states that if 50% of the houses on the block have reduced setbacks, if you were gonna build, rebuild an infill house, you could follow the same setbacks as the rest of the homes. So the idea here is that you line the houses up on the block. So if let's say a house would burn down in the middle of the block and you were going to rebuild it, we wouldn't make you follow the new setbacks and push that house back and have you know all of them fairly consistent and then have one that juts back and kind of do like that. We would ho hope to try to line them all up with the streets so you have some um, you know consistency. We also have a process through the Board of Zoning Appeals that would allow one to apply through a public process to request an ordinance change. So, um, and the, the Zone of Boarding Appeals deals with this on a regular basis and issues hundreds of these a year to help facilitate redevelopment and reinvestment in our older neighborhoods by reducing setbacks and, and working through those uh, processes. So. We have a means to be able to do that and we've been pretty responsive to those needs. The next recommendation is allow accessory dwelling units or ADUs by right in all single family districts. So this is a, a good way of thinking of an ADU or an accessory dwelling structure is a mother-in-law suite or some type of other family housing unit. So an ADU is a secondary housing unit on a single family residential lot. Um, the next one over is smaller lot sizes combined with existing housing, garages, and sheds makes for cramped neighborhoods. So you can see in the illustration in the second blue box from the left um, where you have a house, an ADU, a garage, and a shed, you do not have a lot of green space left. So that's the challenge we have with our smaller lot sizes is that if you're going to do, if we're gonna regulate and allow people to do these accessory dwelling units already on small lots, um, it's only gonna get more cramped in our neighborhoods. Now, is there some opportunity for accessory dwelling units maybe on top of a garage or some kind of existing structure? I think there is some possibility um, for that, so we'll have to analyze that going forward. And then a concern to be considered is when they are sold, do these ADUs become rental units? Or another concern is um, the density get too high. We had this on Erie Avenue where Habitat just finished the new homes. There was houses double wide, triple wide in there. Um, and then you kind of create this little neighborhood within a neighborhood and police, the, the police can't see what's going on and you just create crime issues because you uh, have all this densely platted houses on top of houses. So, you know, those are some of the concerns that need to be looked at. ADUs may be feasible on larger lots. Some communities have allowed these uh, through a conditional use permit, allowing neighbors to be part of that process. So I think there is some possibility out of all of the recommendations, this is probably the one we'll explore a little bit further to see if there is any possibility in zoning districts that have larger lot sizes, but in our typical lot size in the central city, um, we're not recommending adopting this uh, clearly because of the issue of being so densely platted. The next recommendation is permit residential uses including multifamily in, in all commercial districts. So we do that right now. Um, our commercial districts are considered urban residential 12, neighborhood office, neighborhood commercial 
commercial and central commercial. So from the map in the center of the diagram, you can see that yellow is the uh, urban residential 12, which allows for multifamily. Uh, the blue is the neighborhood office zones. Uh, red is neighborhood commercial. And then the green is central commercial. So a lot of the downtown um, is zone central commercial, which uh, you can see that we have multifamily in those districts already. Um, this also would be in areas kind of out of the downtown, um, north uptown area. Um, those areas are, are zoned neighborhood commercial um, and through a conditional use permit process, you're able to uh, construct multifamily in those districts. Reduce or eliminate parking minimums. Um, in the central commercial zone, which was a majority of this map, so the green on here, uh, parking minimums are waived as part of those developments. So uh, in the area from A Street, from Pennsylvania to about Michigan, uh, it is a central commercial zone. It goes out a little bit wider to like 7th and 8th, uh, 9th Streets as well, but that area, we do not require parking uh, minimum. So if you're going to develop a multifamily housing, it's really up to the developer to put in the amount of parking they think they're going to need to facilitate their rental. But if they wanted to go less or not have any at all, that's their prerogative and they can do what they uh, want in those areas. In the other zoning districts, there's variances are recommended as part of the conditional use process. So you can get lesser amounts in the other ones. Um, as an exception to the conditional use permit. So when they come in for plan approval, uh, they can request that and most of the time those are granted. The last recommendation is to assess and streamline the subdivision and workforce housing application process, including standards that direct development outcomes and time limit on municipal response. The city of Sheboygan does not have a problem with this. You can get a plan approval if you follow the process and get everything in within 30 days. On average, um, there is a caveat state law does require us to post um, any type of plan uh, commission applications for two weeks in the newspaper. So um, we're required by law to do that. So that contributes to the amount of time. But for new subdivisions, um, you could have plan approval for the preliminary plat to move forward with the project. Uh, within 60 days, um, including the additional steps that are required by law. The toolkit rec recommends 90 or fewer days for approvals, and I know there's a lot of communities across the state of Wisconsin that take 90 plus days to get approval. Um, we've streamlined that process as, as efficient as we can and can get that done in 30, as 30 to 60 days. Most of them are a 30-day time frame. So the only recommendation that we think uh, could use some additional uh, look as the allowing accessory dwelling units by right in all single family districts with larger lot sizes. So we would, we're doing an analysis now to see if there's any um, opportunity for that. And if there is, it would come back as to this body as part of a zoning uh, ordinance change uh, to see if that, if that would work for us. So that's it in a nutshell of the recommendations. Does anybody have any questions? Questions, comments, concerns, thoughts, ideas from council members? Uh, Alder Feldy. Thank you. Um, Chad, is this also on uh, municipality um, website or? It is, but I can send a, tomorrow morning I can email the link to the document to all the council members so that you can read through it. That'd be great, thank you. <coughs> Any other thoughts, comments from Alders? Alder Prella. Yes, um, the first one that you mentioned, the first or the seventh, um, well, the picture you put there is kind of um, inherently controversial because it's a huge building and so on, but aren't there possible compromises on what you could Build in areas that right now have different type of limits. Correct. That was pretty. That was pretty far to the side uh, to just show what could happen in that district. But yes, we would hopefully be able to work with them to get it more toned into the neighborhood. But the, if you approved multifamily by right, they could put up as a skyscraper if they wanted. So then, would you please explain what what that means by right? 
By right would mean that we they wouldn't have to come in for a, it would be a permitted use within that district. So it wouldn't require any kind of rezoning or anything of that. They by right can build it and then they would just, they could just go through the land use process, which is a, a public hearing to the planning commission, but the council per se wouldn't necessarily have um, you know, a part, a part of that process because it wouldn't require a rezone. So the recommendation from the league is that we would rezone and then everybody could do that by right. The, the recommendation by the league is not to rezone and make it more efficient and easier for developments to happen in single family zones. So you wouldn't have a rezone process, be, that process would be eliminated. So then would that allow for more or less of those type of buildings? Would that, say that so again? So then if we were to follow their recommendation, would, we, would there be more uh, options for builders, constructors to build yes. without? Yes, there would be if that's what we want in our single family zones. Right, so but could we allow that with different types of limitations on the type of buildings and can be built on those zones, in those zones? Chuck would like to answer this because there is some, there, we're, there's stuff that we can limit and there's stuff that we can't limit um, by some recent action at the state. I don't know, Chuck, if you wanna. Yeah, you can, you can define uh, things in your zone. So for example, you, you might still put in a residential uh, uh, zone, you could still put height limits, you could, you could make it, you know, that you allow two families, things like that. So, you know, the, the example in the photo is sort of an extreme example, right. but, that, but there could be other limits that would be put on sort of in the definition of the district. Right. Thank you. All right, Alder Flicky Paneski. Sure, thank you. I saw you. your hand moving. I was, I was like, I, yeah. Thank you. Um, so I'm understanding that these are recommendations coming from the League of Municipalities, and that for our purposes in this city, the only one that likely has some applicability is the multi. The accessory uh, dwelling unit the accessory one. Accessory yes. dwellings in certain areas, which is going to be under review. Correct. Thank you. So you're good with the housing development proposal then for North Point? Is that <laughs> our, my understanding? So, no. Okay. Not so much. No objection. Okay. So moved. Okay. Um, additional feedback, comments from elders? All right. I'm sure that. Housing will be a continuous topic that we discuss <laughs> moving forward. So thank you, Director Pelchek. All right, next, item number five, resignations, uh, City Attorney. Thank you, there's one resignation uh, from Marcus Savaglio, uh, resigning from his position as District 5 Alder Person, effective May 4, 2022. All right, Alder Feldy. I move to accept and file. There's been a motion and a second. Any discussion? Mm -hmm. Seeing none, all those in favor of accepting and filing, please state aye. Aye. Any objection? That item is approved. Number six, city attorney. Uh, there are uh, also appointments. Uh, the mayor submits the following appointments for your consideration. Lisa Salgado to be considered for appointment to the mayor's international committee to fill a vacancy with a term expiring on April 17, 2023 and Faye Wingrove to be considered for appointment to the Board of Review to fill a vacancy with the term expiring April 20, 2026. All right, and those appointments will lay over until our next meeting. Thank you. Next public forum, anyone here for a public forum tonight? City clerk? There is no one this evening. All right, next we'll do mayoral announcements. Well, good evening, everyone. Happy Monday uh, here in the sunny Wisconsin weather that we're having in May. Great, great kick to May. 
Um, just a few quick announcements and proclamations for today. Just a friendly reminder that this Wednesday, this Wednesday is the, the highly anticipated uh, community town hall, which will be on May 4th at 5.30 p.m. right here at City Hall in the Council Chambers. So come listen from our friends at Visit Sheboygan, the Business Improvement District, SCEDC, Chamber of Commerce, as well as your friends at the city as well too. So um, this should be a, a fun and educational event, so please, uh, Hope to see you there. Bring, <laughs> I was gonna say bring snacks, but I think this will this will be this will be a good meeting. This 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 lot of lot of good information will be here. Um, also, May is Young Professionals Month, um, so there are some nominees uh, from the city uh, that have been nominated. I'm looking at her in the monitor here uh, that have been nominated uh, for Young Professional of the Year Award. So we're really proud of our finance director for, for being one of the, the nominees uh, for that as well. So um, there's also, there you go, Scott, move the camera. There we go, perfect. Um, so hopefully we'll be uh, having to announce um, that as well. So check out the Chamber of Commerce website as well. There's a lot of young professional uh, events uh, going on uh, through, through the month of May. Um, so stated item number five, we recently just accepted the resignation from Marcus Valio. Um, he was here. 30 minutes b before the meeting, um, his, his wife had a, a medical um, emergency, uh, so he had to take her to urgent care. Um, so regretfully, he is missing his, his final meeting, uh, but we'll, we'll be here uh, at the next meeting to, to do some, some official uh, recognitions, recognitions. So his family is growing, his wife is expecting, um, so they need to buy a bigger house, and his new house is in a different district. So, um, so he's he's sadly resigning from the council, and it's been a pleasure serving with Alder Svalio for 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 the five years. Him and I were elected uh, at the same time in 2017. So um, he is no longer the most senior member of the council uh, at that time. So um, so we'll uh, we'll miss uh, Marcus uh, on his new adventures as well. So um, some proclamations. So Julie from Mental Health America is here. Um, come on up, Julie. So. We'll be doing a proclamation for Mental Health uh, Awareness Month, and I'll quick read the proclamation here. Whereas mental health is essential to everyone's overall health and well-being, and whereas all Americans express times of difficulty and stress in their lives, and whereas prevention is an effective way to reduce the burden of mental health conditions, and whereas there is a strong body of research that supports specific tools for all Americans to better utilize and handle our challenges and protect their health and well-being, Whereas mental health conditions are real and prevalent in our nation, and whereas with effective treatment, those individuals with mental health concerns can recover and lead full positive lives, and whereas each business's school, government, agency, healthcare provider, and organizations promote the well being of mental health and supportive services for effective treatment. Now, therefore, I, Ryan Sorensen, Mayor of the Great City of Sheboygan, do hereby proclaim Mount this month, May 2022, as Mental Health Month. So I know. Um, a lot of our departments, whether police, fire, transit, the library, no matter what department that we're in in the, uh, in the city, we, we impact those that are um, struggling with mental health concerns. And it's great to have our friends at Mental Health America uh, be a great ally um, in making our community a better place. So I'll pr pr present this proclamation to Julie. Um, you have a few words that you'd like to say? Absolutely, thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much to the entire council and the municipality of Sheboygan. Um, in 2021, we had the highest rate of suicide within Sheboygan County that we've recorded. And many of those lives lost came from this municipality within the city of Sheboygan. One in five of us will have a mental illness at some point throughout our lives. And 50% of mental illnesses present themselves before the age of 14, 75% before the age of 24. And I wanna say to the entire council and anyone that's listening out there, let's look out for each other. This is a tight knit community here in Sheboygan County. If you see somebody that doesn't seem right, say something, get them to the appropriate people. And I would just wanna give a shout out to law enforcement. They do so much within this city. They take thousands of calls each year for mental health and they're acting as social workers. And I just wanna give a shout out to all of the work that you do here. Um, and thank you for making this proclamation. So thank you. Thank you, Julie.
I missed my sticky note here when I was talking about Marcus. Um, so since there is an opening on the city council, um, applications to fill the position will be due to the city clerk's office on May 12th um, by the end of business day. So please uh, get, for those watching, get, get that information into the clerk's office by May 12th and council will be voting um, uh, to fill the appointment on or at our next meeting, May 16th. So that's that note on that. And speaking of the clerk's office, can I have uh, both our city clerk and our deputy city clerk come on down? <laughs> They're both giving me looks because they didn't know this was coming, but maybe they did. All right, so whereas the Office of Municipal Clerk is a time-honored and vital part in local governance throughout our, the work that they do, whereas the Office of Municipal Clerk is one of the oldest among public service, and whereas the Office of Municipal Clerk provides professional link between the residents and local governments and all the agencies at all levels, whereas municipal clerks have pledged to be ever mindful of their neutrality and impartiality, um, and making sure that their work is done in a clear mind, and whereas municipal clerks serve as the information center of all functions of local government, and whereas municipal clerks can, can continually drive to strive for improvement of administration throughout the city, and whereas in most appropriate, we recognize the accomplishments and all the great work that our municipal clerks do, and whereas Municipal Clerk Weeks is celebrating its 53rd anniversary in 2022, and now I, Ryan Sorensen, Mayor of the City of Sheboygan, do hereby proclaim this week, May 1st through the 7th, as Municipal Clerks Week. So it's an election year, so there's four elections, two down, two more to go, um, so we're really blessed. We do set the gold standard in, in having municipal clerks here. Um, there's a lot of moving parts, working with the council members, preparing agendas, doing recounts and ties, uh, which was a first for our clerk's office as well, but they, they do a darn good job and we're, we're so blessed to have them. So I'll present this to our city clerk, Meredith the Bruin. So anything to say or? All right, she just says thank you. So <laughs> thank you everybody. Jump right along to the consent agenda, items 10 through 12, Alder Feldy. Thank you, Mayor. I move to receive and file all ROs and receive all RCs and adopt all resolutions and ordinances. Second. There's been a motion second. Discussion on any items on the consent agenda. Anybody, even Joe Trueblood came in for item 10, just in case. <laughs> All right, sounds good. Seeing no discussion, uh, please refer to your muni code to, to vote. Oh, geez, I didn't do mine. There are nine eyes. All right, the consent agenda is approved. Next is item 13, RO number 82223 by the City Plan Commission, to whom was referred RO number 1462122 by the City Clerk, General Ordinance number 432122 by Older Persons Decker, granting Old World Creamery LLC and its successors and assigns to the privilege of encroaching upon described portions of St. Clair Avenue right away in the city of Sheboygan for the purposes of creating a concrete approach. Alder Decker. Thank you, Mayor. I make a motion to file the RO and adopt the ordinance. Second. Motion and second. Any discussion on this item? Seeing none, this is a voice vote. All those in favor, please state aye. 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 Any objection? Seeing none, item 13 is approved. Items 14 and 15 will be referred to their respective committees. Item 16, resolution number 9, 22, 23, by Alders Feldy, 
Flicky Paneski authorizing the appropriate city officials to sign the January 1st, 2022 through December 31st, 2022 contract between the City of Sheboygan and the Sheboygan Professional Police Officer Supervisory Association. Alder Feldy? I ask to suspend the rules. Any objection? Seeing none, please proceed with the motion. I move to adopt the resolution. Second. Motion in a second to adopt the resolution. Any discussion? Uh, Alder Decker? I guess I just have one question. Uh, why is it only a one-year contract? Do we not do multi-year contracts on some of these? Who wants to take this one? Uh, finance director? It actually is a two-year contract for both this item and also the next item for the police union. Any other discussion? Does it need to be amended? I, be amended? Belie I believe looking at the actual um, resolution in the packet, it shows December 2023, but in the agenda item, it shows 2022. Okay. So the resolution is correct. Perfect. Okay. Okay. Sorry, Thank you. Me. Additional comments from Alders? No. All right. This is a roll call vote. Please refer to your muni code. Alder person rest. There are nine eyes. All right, that's approved. Next item 17, RO number 102223 by Alder persons Feldy and Flicky Paneski authorizing the appropriate city officials to sign the January 1st, 2022, December 31st, 2023 contract between the city of Sheboygan and the Sheboygan Professional Police Officers Association. Alder Feldy. I ask to suspend the rules. Any objection? Seeing none, please proceed. I move to adopt the resolution. Second. There's been a motion and second. Any discussion on this item? Seeing none, please refer to your muni code. Alder person Ackley. There are nine eyes. All right, that item is approved. Items 18 through 26 will be referred to the respective committees. Next is a contemplated close session. Alder Feldy. I move to convene in closed session under the exemption provision in section 19.851E of the Wisconsin statute for the purpose of deliberating regarding possible development incentives for an affordable housing project located on the north northeast corner of Erie Avenue and North 13th Street. Second. There's been a motion and a second Thank you. to go into closed session. This is a roll call vote. Please refer to your muni code. And for those at home, we will be adjourning after closed session, so this will be ending our program for the day. So. Alder person Mitchell. There are nine eyes. All right, that's approved.
We'll recess for three minutes and we'll assemble in the 305, 305 closed session room. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Did you say